I want you to take your Bibles and turn there with me to Exodus chapter 33 as we continue to talk about our call to be holy. I'm just going to run this up while you're turning there. Because I will forget it for sure. Exodus 33. Talk a little bit today about seeking God's face. Moses uh, had been called by God to lead in so many different ways. I, I mean, think about it. I've only got a church of uh, about 90 to 100 here to try to, to lead under God's guidance. And Moses had, anybody know how many people he was trying to lead? There were six million that were with, with him. And uh, he was sort of the key leader. And he was pretty scared as he ought to be. And um, he pleaded with the Lord to get to know him a little bit better. And this is that passage here. Lord, if you're going to use me to uh, take these folks on this journey, uh, I need to know you better. And so here's what it says in uh, Exodus 33, verse 12. One day Moses said to the Lord, You've been telling me take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You've told me I know you by name and I look favorably on you. If that is true, that you look favorably on me, then let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. And the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Everything will be fine for you. About 10 years ago that I uh, took a sabbatical, much needed one. I had been pastoring at that point for almost 25 years, six days a week, and a few scattered holidays here and there, and to be honest, I was tapped out. I was pretty bagged. And I knew that I couldn't keep on going the way that I was. I knew that I had started to get pretty mechanical after that many years in pastoral ministry or any ministry or any job. You begin to understand what levers to pull and what buttons to push, and you can get very mechanical about it. And I realized that I needed a fresh encounter with God. I needed a place where there was uh, no more meetings, there were no more care groups or Bible studies or sermons to prepare for. I needed no phone calls in my life. I needed to be away from funerals and weddings and counseling and visitation. I needed to be away from conflict, which can be so difficult for pastors to deal with. I really need to be just kind of apart from those unexpected interruptions that happen as well. I really just needed me and God up on a mountain somewhere. I was hungry for it. I was desperate for it. I had nothing left to give to my people. I was burned out. I needed to experience God in my life again in a fresh, fresh way, or I knew I'd be quitting. And my elders at the time, this was in Saskatoon, could see it. And so they asked me to take this four-month sabbatical. And it wasn't a working one. I was thankful for that. I said, if I'm going to take a sabbatical, I need time off. And they said, just go and be with God. And so I was so thankful for that. Because a lot of pastors, when they take sabbaticals, are required to do all these different modules and all that kind of stuff. And these guys said, just go be with God. And I was so thankful for that. So I bought a backpack and I stuffed it with my Bible. And there are a few books that God had uh, brought my way that I wanted to read. And every day for four months, this was back in 2011, 
I would make my way down to the river in Saskatoon and I would cross that train bridge to the other side and to the university side and I would sit overlooking the city on a little bench up over top of uh, the river and you could see the city on the other side of the river and I felt a little bit like a prophet waiting to hear from God and I spent a lot of time there. And I would pour out my heart to Jesus and, and I say, Lord, I need a greater revelation from you or I'm going to perish. I am so empty right now. I need you to fill me again. And he did slowly over that four month period. He filled me like I have never experienced before. But can I tell you something? This will never happen if you are not willing to seek God with your whole heart, your whole mind, all of you, everything. God told me during that sabbatical to get rid of my computer and get rid of my phone. He wanted my attention all to himself. And so I did. Because he had seen in me what I knew was starting to happen, that out of absolute exhaustion I was starting to get lukewarm and half-hearted and I was cheating myself and my family and the people in my church because after almost 25 years of go, 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 I was exhausted and I had been steering away from God and from his people and flirting with the things of the world because pastoral ministry demands that you give and that you give and then you give some more and then when you're done giving you give just a little bit more. It can squeeze every last ounce out of you if you let it. It demands your time, your allegiance, your loyalty, even your family life. And I just had nothing left to give. I'd already laid it all out on the altar. And so the journey back to God began for me 10 years ago. Lord, I have to confess to you, I said, I am tired of serving you. I love you, but I am tired of serving you. And I just want to know you all over again. I just want to return to my first love, which is my love for Jesus. I am tired of all of the leadership manuals. I am tired of all of the Christian self-help conferences that I'm supposed to go to. I just want to get to know you better all over again. And bit by bit over the next four months, it happened. But I had to put everything aside and focus on God. And I want to share with you a little bit this morning some of the things that he began to teach me. And it'll lead us even more into this series I want to do with you on the holiness of God. Here's what he began to show me as I sat on that bench over the river. And sometimes I'd wander up to the library at the university and just pour myself into him. It was such a quiet place to be. And um, first thing that he began to remind me of is that he is altogether different than any of us sitting here today. Let me say that again. God is altogether different than any of us that are sitting here today. God is not just some superior form of human, human being. He's not just greater than the mountains or the planets or the universe. God is altogether different in every way from everything that he has created. God is a being who lives in an existence that is greater than anything that you and I can ever understand or try to imagine, and yet we still do try to imagine what God is actually like. What does he really look like? Is he pure energy? Is he pure thought? Is he just a force kind of like you would find in the Star Wars trilogy? Does God have arms? Does he have legs? What is he like? 
Jesus gives us the definitive answer. He said, God is spirit. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. What he means by this is that God is spirit and exists outside of time and space. He's not limited to the things that he has made. The Bible says, will God really dwell on the earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this temple I have built. God is a being who exists without any size or dimensions. He doesn't even fit into heaven, which, by the way, is also a created thing, although he dwells there as well. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. Has not my hand made all of these things? And so they came into being. Where then is the house you'll build for me or the place where I can rest, declares the Lord. You can't measure God. You cannot contain God. He is everywhere present, and yet he lives in this existence that is entirely apart from everything else that he has created. Before he created the universe, there was no matter, there was no space, there were no material things. There was nothing but God that we know of. He created all of this. Even heaven and his throne are created for him to express himself on, but they can't contain him in all of his fullness and his glory. And so somewhere, somehow, in all of the glorious fullness of himself, God exists. He is both in the world and he's outside of the world. He is like no other being. His existence is not like yours and mine. He is spirit. And whatever that means, it is, it is a kind of existence that is unlike anything else in all of creation. And so I came across a good working definition of all of this when I was down by the riverside 10 years ago. And it comes out of one of my favorite theologians, a guy by the name of Wayne Grudem. He's uh, one of our modern theologians. He says, God's spirituality means that God exists as a being that is not made of any matter, has no parts or dimensions, is unable to be perceived by our bodily senses, and is more excellent than any other kind of existence. That last part really grabbed me, I remember. His existence is more excellent than any other kind of existence. Now, why does he exist as a spirit? Well, all we can really say is that he exists as a spirit because this is the greatest and most excellent way to be. It is a form of existence that is superior to anything that we know, which is why we are forbidden by him to say that he is like something else in the universe, because God is not like something else in the universe. God is not similar to what he has created. God is not similar to human beings. God is not similar to ghosts and goblins. God is not similar to unseen energy forces. To think of God as existing in a form that is like anything else that he has created in this universe is frankly to blasphemously misrepresent him. God is not like a golden calf. God is not like a fat little Chinese man. God is not like a big Santa Claus up in the sky. God is not like a vapor or a cloud or some kind of a mist. God is greater than anything we could ever imagine, dream up, or think. So Moses, take your shoes off. You are standing on holy ground. God exists in an existence that is altogether different than what you and I could ever know. And the psalmist said, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. How many of you remember that book years ago called Your God is Too Small? Anybody ever encounter that book? No? It was popular about 25 years ago. 
Your God is too small. Isn't that true? I mean, we reduce him, don't we? We reduce him in our mind. So because he is so much bigger than what we can really imagine that we just sort of think about him in pieces. And I suppose that's okay because that's all we can do in our current state, but it's so much bigger than all of this. That was one of the first things that he began to show me as I bent over my Bible for four months. Secondly, he began to remind me that he is the most intelligent being in the universe. God knows everything. God knows everything. Everything there is to know, God knows. He is perfect in knowledge, the Bible says. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all of my purpose. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Even the hairs of your head are all numbered, Jesus said. I mean, can you imagine always being fully aware of absolutely everything? Not just everything in all of creation that there is to know, but also everything about everything about everything, and he knows everything there is to know about himself. This is a God who has no beginning and has no end, and yet he knows everything about everything, including everything about his infinite, unlimited self. I mean, try wrapping your head around that. The Bible says that his greatness is unsearchable, and yet God has searched his own greatness out. And even though his knowledge and his characteristics and his existence are infinite and unlimited, God still knows everything there is to know about himself. I mean, that just began to blow me away. God is infinite and unlimited, and yet he knows everything all the way down, all the way down the line about himself and about everything else. It's stunning. It's indescribable. Can you imagine knowing everything about everything on the internet all the time? Every little detail, every little nuance always present right there in your mind, you would go insane. And the interesting thing is that counselors and psychologists are starting to encounter a generation that is really struggling with life, and part of it is because the internet has opened up what we never ever experienced before the internet. It is global now, and there's information everywhere, and we are on our phones all the time, aren't we? Let's be honest. We're on our phones a lot. We're processing, we're searching, and we're looking at all this grand, wonderful stuff, and they're starting to discover that it's starting to affect our psyches because God didn't build us to know everything about everything, and yet we're trying to get to know everything we can off the Internet. And it's driving some of us crazy. It doesn't drive God crazy. God is God. He knows everything about everything, everything that's on the Internet, everything that is in every corner of this universe, which they still haven't found an end to, he knows everything about you. He knows everything about me. There is nothing that is hidden from his sight. He knows all of those things. He knows everything about himself. And he's able to process it. I mean, wow. What a mighty God we serve. I mean, it's just amazing to me. And in all of that, he is perfect in every way. Absolutely perfect.
God knows everything about everything, always, all the time. There's no little scrap of knowledge that he's overlooked. There's nothing that has slipped through his fingers without his knowledge. And God uses every little piece of information in the wisest and in the most noble way. Our Lord God, Jehovah, Adonai, is greater than the greatness of this universe. He is greater than the greatness of the Internet. He is greater than the greatness of my problems. For I am God, and there is none other like me. I'm running out of time, but there's one more thing I want to add in here. This would be kind of scary if we didn't have the assurance that with all of God's infinite knowledge, He also has infinite wisdom and love and saving grace. Can you imagine if Lucifer... The fallen angel who fancied himself at one point to sh that he should be getting some of the credit that God was getting and who descended into a inner world of evil after being God's greatest angel. Can you imagine that he that if he had all the attributes that God has, except that there was darkness in his heart. Can you imagine how scary that would be? I'm thankful that he doesn't, that he's a limited creature like we are. And I am thankful that God, who knows everything about everything about everything, is also infinite in his wisdom and in his love and in his saving grace. God's wisdom means that God always chooses the best goals and the best means to reach those goals. Romans 16, 27 calls him the only wise God. Job says that God is wise in his heart. And he says again, with him are wisdom and power. He has counsel and he has understanding. God can be trusted with everything. Now, does that mean that we're just foolish and we jump off into every little thing? No. I mean, that was one of the temptations that the enemy brought to Jesus. Well, if you're God, jump off of this thing. God will rescue you. Just fly off the top of the temple here. Jesus said, mm, no, that's not how it works. And stop trying to test my father. But I trust him with everything. And I do too. And so, if you have received Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, you can be certain that God is working wisely in your life right now. For God works all things together for good to those who love him and who are called according to his purposes. So this is the starting point for moving into the holiness and the grandeur of God over the next few weeks. Jesus Christ is a great and a mighty God. And yet in his infinite greatness, or maybe because of his infinite greatness, he is willing to stoop down out of heaven and help us as we struggle in our sin. God is holy. God is separated from every single stench of sin. And he casts it out of his presence when it dares to enter in. Lucifer discovered that, as did a third of the angels. And yet he is willing to reach down to us made in his image, love us, and rescue us, and 
forgive us. And think about this for a minute. This great, mighty, holy, perfect God was willing to take your sin and mine on himself. I don't know how that works. It certainly didn't change his character any, did not make God a sinner. He is always perfect and holy in every way. And yet somehow, some way, at the cross of Jesus Christ, his son took not only the punishment for our sin, but took our sin upon himself. Hung there, drenched in the sin of mankind, and took our punishment for us. The wages of sin is death. Not just physical, but eternal. And yet the Son of God was sent by God to rescue us from that. Jesus said, even though you die, if you believe in me and what I have done for you, yet shall you live. Yet shall you live. That's his gift to us. Isn't that amazing? I mean, God didn't have to do that. And when you look back in time, you look back towards the beginning of the Old Testament, God did make a decision once where he wiped out all of mankind, except for one family, who happened to have a really big boat. And he started over again with them because it's in his heart to do that, this great, amazing God. I don't know about you, but if I were God, and I'm glad I'm not, I would probably have been so offended by all of this that I would have just said, experiment's over. You're all toast. I'm thankful that God has been willing to come and rescue us but we must believe in what he has done. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, and there's the key, whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. For God did not come into the world to condemn the world, and you've heard me say this before, if God didn't come into the world to condemn the world, then it's not our job to condemn the world either. He came that it might be saved, and our job also is to try to bring salvation to this world. God is the judge. He will judge, not us. So let me read these verses again. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. For God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It's really unbelievable. And yet I believe it. And it's indescribable. Our God is an awesome God. Next week, we'll look a little bit more at his holiness, his purity. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for reminding us again today of your infinite greatness. We often are reaching for greatness ourselves in some way or another. I want to be great looking or great leader or great this or great that, maybe a great musician or a great hockey player or a great Hollywood actor. That dims in the light of your greatness. Father, Help us to be mindful in our relationship with you, 
of your eternal greatness. That we might trust you, that we might also fear you. Because one word from your throne and anything can happen, anything can change. But we thank you that you love us with a great love and that you're merciful to us with a great mercy and that you're compassionate with great compassion. Help us, Lord, to uh, just rest in that and help us, Lord, to administer that to each other as well as to our community here in Meadow Lake and in our province and our country and around the world. You are holy. You are holy. Amen.